Today we're gonna see how incredibly quickly a property crime can turn into a deadly threat. Hi everyone, welcome to today's lesson here at Active Self Protection. I'm your host, John Correa. Today's video comes to us out of Denver, Colorado, and the defender in today's video is today's guest on the ASP podcast. You gotta listen to his story. You can catch that at the link in the description or I've pinned it to the top comment. It is an incredible story and got some great lessons there. You can catch it in the ASP Unlimited app on the light tier because we make the podcast public or you can catch it on all the podcasting apps. To win the fight after the fight, you need help. After a use of force, I trust Firearms Legal Protection to help me win the fight for the rest of my life. From their 24 seven attorney answered hotline to coverage for the use of all legal tools, Firearms Legal Protection has you covered. Get a discount by signing up at the link below. You can see that it's nighttime. Our defender, whose name is Alex, go please, go listen to his interview, has remembered and realized that he left a key fob to the pickup truck in the bottom left in the pickup truck. He looks at their security cameras and realizes somebody has jumped in that truck and is trying to do like a 14 point turn in order to steal it and he has an accomplice as well. Alex is going to decide to go out there and confront them while armed with a pistol. Let's listen into what happens. They both took off down the road and they did find the pickup truck a few blocks away. And from what Alex said, it had copious amounts of blood inside of it. Police never found either one of these folks. They did end up taking Alex's pistol for a short time. He did get it back fairly quickly though. He was never felt like he was any kind under any kind of investigation. Police never found these guys. They did recover the truck and his dad, Alex's dad, as punishment for leaving the key fob in the truck, made him clean all the blood out of the pickup truck himself. That was what dad did. I absolutely love it when we get to interview the defender. That's why we started the Ask Podcast to let real life self-defenders tell their stories of how it happened in their mind. And, and having that combined with the video just gives us so much to think about and talk about and really teaches us real life self-defense. I love it. Let's think about lessons. Let's just say from the outset, obviously stealing somebody's car is wrong. I've had a car stolen out of the driveway of my home and, and it feels like it's a very invasive thing and obviously a, a really crazy part here. And of course, uh, you know, if you leave your key fob in your car when it's sitting outside, uh, I mean, you know, chances are good that, that bad things happen. So don't do that, right? So if we just have the key fob in the house and the door's locked, they probably go on to try to go rob somebody else or whatever. So take appropriate precautions, right? Don't leave stuff sitting in the car. Don't leave the car with a big sign on it that says, please steal me. And God forbid, don't leave guns in vehicles because this is what happens. And this is why uh, guns, unsecured guns end up in the hands of felons. Now, uh, you know, he sees this on his, his security cameras. I love having security cameras in the house. It gives you some understanding of what's going on outside without having to enter into that danger. I love it. And now thinking about this here, okay, fine. I've got at least two people here that I know that are trying to steal my car. Are they armed? I don't necessarily see anything here but I might have seen that the female who was in the white car is armed. And so now is it okay for me to go outside and confront them? Well, of course it's morally and legally acceptable to stop somebody from stealing your property, okay? And when we're talking about stealing property, we talk about the use of ordinary force. So, so the force that we use must be proportionate to the threat that we face. And somebody stealing our property, that is a property crime. And therefore that is, uh, you know, it, it is justified to use ordinary force, not deadly force, to protect our property. That said though, having a gun on your person, probably really wise here in case 
they had the means to, to uh, initiate deadly harm and, and to threaten us with deadly harm, then we could defend ourselves with deadly force. So having that would be wise. But of course, that's exactly what goes down here is this woman comes out and now points a gun at him. Now, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I didn't get to interview Alex, but you know, again, this was a gunfight that you go, hey man, uh, I went out there and, and sure enough, I did get in a gunfight and she did end up firing around at me. So is this justified defensive deadly force on his part? Of course it is, 100%, no question about it, but it is an optional gunfight. He could have seen what was going on out there, called the cops, stayed in the house, not put himself at that risk. Now, I know some people are gonna say, yeah, but he had the right to stop them from stealing his vehicle. Absolutely, just recognize it's a risk. I also wanna say, I believe, my guess is, is that Alex hit her with the first shot. Though the cops will never know. And, you know, well, they haven't caught either one of them. But notice here that she flinched hard enough that her bullet hit the ground right in front of her. So this could be FIBSA, fudge I'm being shot at. I don't think so. That level of flinch really looks to me like FIBS. It really looks to me like he got her. So if I was a betting man, I would bet she got hit with that first shot. They ran off a little bit. She jumped in, his, in, in the stolen pickup truck, said, oh no, I'm shot. And then I'm not sure if our dummy, you know, the, the dude involved here, then ends up getting her in the vehicle and, you know, dumping her somewhere later or whatever. You know, he doesn't look like a guy that's, as Mike said in the interview, like he's holding doors for her or laying his jacket down over puddles. So listen, I also think here that what Alex did was a really good job that as soon as this deadly force encounter started, he retreated, right? So remember what your mission is as a self-defender is to break contact with deadly threats. And so as soon as the shooting started, he put rounds down range, put them on her and then got the heck out of there. And I think that was absolutely the right choice. You heard here, he shot, I think eight shots here. You can hear them on the camera. And, and I think those were all justified. I don't have any problems with any of them whatsoever. So he did drive them off. He did lose the car. They did end up getting it back in relatively short order from the district attorney, from the police department, and he got his firearm back. I will say at the end, this is one of the reasons that I love uh, services like Firearms Legal Protection. They're the one that I choose because what they do is, again, they have a benefit in their package that provides to replace the firearm that you used in a deadly force encounter because it's gonna get taken and put it into, into custody as evidence in all this crime as to what happened. So thankfully he got his back pretty quick. I love having the ability to you know get that replaced pretty quick. I also really would encourage you to maybe think about having a backup for that reason. I think Alex did a pretty good job here. I think we should think a little bit about whether we should go outside and even confront because of the danger that it brings to us when we do so because they did end up having the means of deadly force and a willingness to use it. I think Alex did defend himself here okay. I think it was moral what he did. I think that, you know, let's think about some of those lessons, make sure that we understand how to use deadly force, when to use deadly force, do it adequately when it's time, and cover our ASP.